the one that sustains us throughout the week. Yes. We don't want to just come here and, and to be fed just on one day, but we want to have the energy throughout the week. We, we ask those uh, blessings, Father, that yes. uh, you will give us that fire to last us throughout this week. Amen. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's with uh, gratitude that I'm able to uh, introduce or reintroduce uh, Dr. Fidel. So uh, Bill is going to uh, give us a, a sermon today, and I'll let him uh, describe what that is. But welcome. Thank you. attracted to the Old Testament and to Ecclesiastes. It's a strange, strange book. And in fact, in some ways, it is so strange that there are people who think it doesn't even belong in the scriptural canon. Solomon is its author. And Solomon, as you know, is a central character in the Old Testament. His father was David. He is said to be the wisest man in all of Israel's history. He even said so himself, that he was the wisest of all the kings that reigned in Jerusalem. Yet, if this is his writing, he has given us a very strange piece of work. It's the stuff of Philosophy 101, where you get together and you ask the tough questions. What is life? Why are we here? What's the purpose of it all? Is there any purpose at all? If life is a journey, where does it lead? What's the end of it? And if you get to the end of it, and we all do, at least as far as death is concerned, and you look back on it, so what? That's what this book seemingly is about. I want to lift up some thoughts in your minds this morning because I think it's important. Uh, particularly uh, if you're younger. I, I, I look at it differently than, uh, than some of you who are yet under, say, <coughs> under 30. I was under 30 once, I don't know, I think. <laughs> Ecclesiastes. By way of introduction, the writer says this, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It's a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold all is vanity and striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be straight, straightened, what is lacking cannot be counted. And so I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And I set my mind to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I realized that this also is striving after wind. 
because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. I said to myself, enough of that. Enough of that intellectual striving after wisdom and knowledge. <clears throat> I, 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 let me go another direction. It's almost like he says, let, let me, oh, oh, here's a road. Let me, let, me go, let, let me go down this one and see where it goes. And so he says, come now. I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was vanity. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with, with wine, while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few days of their lives. And there I, there I stopped and I thought of the commercials that I've been watching on television. All oh, this 20-something group of guys and gals at the bar yeah. and they're sipping mm -hmm. vodka and driving fine-looking cars into the night. And I thought, oh man, what a way to go. If you weren't wise and smart and hadn't grown up a little bit, you'd say, man, that's for me. If I were a young guy, I'd say, dang, dumb. Of course, that's all television's about. All that 20-something crowd that's going to rule the world because after they get through with the vodka. <laughs> wow. And Solomon says, I've been there. I, I, I dig it. I've been there. I understand what that's all about. I tried that. And believe me, I could afford it. So I decided, I decided, uh, uh, let me give my mind to building something that will endure, <clears throat> a, a, perhaps a monument to all of this. And so I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted them with all kinds of fruit trees. I, I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves. Now, man, that is going first class. You get out of your Bentley, write a check, and you buy slaves, male and female. And I had home-born slaves. You raise them like you raise figs. Or vegetables in the garden. You raise slaves. So when mama takes the little children downtown to shop, some other little kid from the suburbs can point his finger and say, look, mommy, a little borny little baby slave. It's got them all over the place. I had herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. I collected for myself silver and gold, the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines, hot dog, brothers living. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Oh, man. And then I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind. There was no profit under the sun. Whew. Breathtaking, really. He pursues the thought. He asks the question, what then is it all about? It seems that we all get up in the morning and walk through the day and we all have the same amount of time. In fact, he goes on to say, there really is a time for everything. 
And you are familiar with the litany that he develops around the idea of time. There's a time to give birth. There's a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones. A time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search. A time to give up the lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. Now, of course, as you know, you don't know me very well, but you know me well enough already to know that I'm no great thinker and no great philosopher. I took philosophy sometime or other way back when because I had to, but I, and I think I passed it, of course, but I never caught on to it. I never, it was okay. And later in years, I'd dabble here and there and I'd read this and that one and, you know, there are schools of thought or this thing. And you know something interesting about philosophers is not hard, they hardly end up in agree. Yeah. They just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and they push it and they push it like this on the strength of the next question. If this is so, this is so, but if this is so, so, and they keep batting it back and forth. It's like ping pong. Uh -huh. and there are schools of thought, and there are people who are devotees of this philosopher, and that one, and so forth and so on. And all of it is filed in this wonderful, under this wonderful caption that he uses here, <clears throat> under the sun. If this, this happens under, this is it. This is all we've got going for us down here, folks. Let's think about it. Let's see if we can get a hold of it. And it kind of slips through your fingers. Just about the time you grab the thing, it turns to dust in your hand. And he says, even that, though, even that process, even that effort, even that, is a gift of God to the children of men. It doesn't seem to bother God at all. He doesn't seem to be upset by any of the conclusions to which we come. Why? Because, he says, God has made everything appropriate in its time he has also set eternity in their heart. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. Yet God has set eternity in their heart. I like that. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? After it all is said and done, after all this moving and shaking, all this philosophical headwork, all the speculations, all the visits to holy places, and all the stuff that goes with all of the apparatus of so-called civilization, there is still that still small voice, that awareness, that deep-seated mystery called eternity, which God has set in the hearts of men and women. What a gift. <clears throat> what a gift. That which is set within the spirit of mankind, that unspeakable question which will not go away, which God calls eternity. When the Christian church gets together, celebrates the core of its faith visibly, when the 
The church gets together to answer together the question that eternity raises. We call it communion. And we gather around a loaf of bread and a jug of wine. And we celebrate an event in which God becomes man to answer that question. What's it all about? Is there purpose? Is there meaning? Can life be lived to the fullest? Can life be lived to the fullest without getting stewed on the weekend? Is there something more than money and power and all of that jazz? And yet, a life full, just full, is it possible here to have life and have it more abundantly. And that act of bread and wine symbolizing the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an answer to that, and there is no other. Wouldn't it be fun? One of these days you ought to do this. You're smart enough. You, you younger guys you, and gals, huh? Check this out. Have some fun with this. T grab uh, this book of Ecclesiastes and have one of you play Solomon. And you get your little retinue around you, a group of counselors, and you work with Solomon to get his head on straight. Forget the New Testament. Just, just work with what you got. Okay, Solomon? His counselors. And over here, you'll get a young woman. I'll make, I'll make a, I'll make I will make Paul, the apostle, a woman. <laughs> and he'll have his disciples around him talking about what Paul understands about life. Because Paul is something of a philosopher, preaches what the dude's got a PhD, he's very smart. Sharp guy. He's been through the whole apparatus of education leading up to the significant heights of ministry in the Jewish community. The guy's sharp. He knows Western thought. He knows Judaic thought. He's sharp. And, and have them exchange ideas back and forth. <coughs> back and forth. And you ask, what Saul of Tarsus got going for him that Solomon doesn't have in that present state? What does he have? And the answer, of course, is Jesus. Jesus. Watch the Apostle Paul, that little run of a guy. He probably wasn't very big. probably wasn't very good looking, really. He wasn't a Hollywood type. He's been all over the Middle East. He's been stoned. He's been, he's been half drowned. He's been, uh, 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 he's been uh, whipped with a lash 39 times, three times. Incredible man. He's luckily to be alive. He's not very healthy. He stands before one of the princes, the whole political apparatus in the Middle East. And he gives his testimony, and he talks about Jesus. And he says, I haven't always been what I am today. I haven't always been a follower of Jesus. If you knew me when, you would know that the guys that now accuse me used to be my brothers and all of this. I know those guys. I went to school with those guys. I preached with those guys in the synagogue. I know their answers. I know I've been there. I am one of them. One day, though, one day, Jesus happened. And he tells about that. Astonishing story. Jesus happened to me. And he tells that story. And the politician looks down upon him and says, Paul, Paul, much learning has made you mad. You are out of your cotton pick and mine. <laughs> you are nuts. And there are people who think that religion does that to you. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I think probably religion can do that to you, but not Jesus. And there's a difference. He looked up into his face and said, with all due respect, sir, if I am crazy, I wish that you and everybody like you were just like me. Yeah. What's the difference? <clears throat> Jesus. Is the difference. What is that all about? It's all about God in 
his wisdom and grace, bringing that eternity which is already somewhat situated in our spirits, bringing that eternity into time and linking the two. The kingdom of heaven has come in Jesus Christ and in his ministry and word and in his life and in the Holy Spirit who imbues his people and the church. Eternity has become visible in Jesus Christ. Uh, eternity, that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. And the good news is you can have eternity in your spirit, in your life, to guide and guard your thoughts and mind and heart and steps on the way to eternity. You have the bird in the hand and the one in the bush. I was looking at, I remember this word eternity and I, like all young people do, I got on the internet. <laughs> and I went to Sydney, Australia. And I looked up a man who made history in that great city after he was converted to Jesus Christ. His name was Arthur Malcolm Stacy. Grew up in a tough home, a child of alcoholics, brought up in poverty, resorted to stealing bread and milk, searching for scraps of food. Became a ward of the state. As a teenager, became an alcoholic, went to jail at 15. In his 20s, he was a scout for his sister's brothels. Interesting guy, he, he was a nothing sort of human being. A wasted life, to be sure. And then, one night in August of 1930, <laughs> after hearing a sermon, <laughs> He became enamored of the word eternity. Never dawned on him until he heard this sermon. And he committed his life to Jesus Christ. And he said, eternity. I wish that I could sound or shout that word to everyone in the streets of Sydney. You've got to meet it. Where will you spend it? This eternity. I felt a powerful call from the Lord to write eternity. So several mornings a week for the next 35 years, he would get up, leave his wife Pearl, and go around the streets of Sydney and chalk the word eternity on footpaths, train station entrances, and everywhere else he can think of. It is estimated that he wrote the word around 500,000 times over the next 35 years. <clears throat> the man who writes eternity then becomes a legend in Sydney. And today, his name is the National Museum of Australia, Canberra. The museum also has an eternity gallery inspired by his story. In Sydney today, the word eternity can be still written, can be still seen written in three places. On his gravestone, inside the bell of the clock tower, which he had dismantled during World War II. When the clock tower was rebuilt, they found the word eternity there. Amazing story. This is the man's legacy. You can find his name in the town hall square between St. Andrew's Cathedral and the Sydney Town Hall. The man is a legend in the city of Sydney because of one word, eternity. And the question, where will you spend it? That word, and that spirit, that cognizance, that awareness seeps into the cultural fabric of a great city because of one man's 
witness. And because it connects with something deep inside the spirit of every human being, which God himself, by his grace and mercy, has situated there. He has set eternity in their hearts, yet so that man would seek for God. And that search inevitably, by the grace of God, and by the Spirit of God, and by the workings of God, ultimately leads us to Jesus, who is life and resurrection, his death, that makes it possible for us to be reconciled to God. It's a fabulous story. A fabulous story. It would be, it would, <laughs> in my imagination, it would be fun to situate Solomon in his passing before the God whom he knew, before the God to whom he addresses himself in a significant way. You know, Solomon, all of his wisdom, sits before God and strokes his long beard. <laughs> And the Spirit of God kind of unpacks this stuff. <laughs> I can just imagine how the wise guy sits there in absolute awe. His mouth is quiet, his heart is silent as he takes in this inestimable gift of God's grace. Let me tell you, Solomon, how this works out. Let me assure you that your words, particularly to young people, were absolutely right. Remember how he closes it? How he speaks to young men and women. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Before the years draw nigh and you get older and you say, I have no pleasure in them. Answer the call of eternity in your heart now. Remember now. There it is. You deal with eternity now. Now. Let me lead you in a word of prayer, please. God, we are <coughs> victims of and captive to our clocks, our watches, and we adorn our wrists with all kinds of jewelry. It's a way of telling other people what our style is and what our values might be. We have clocks, but we don't have a lot of time. We have minutes and hours, but we have no sense of time. So we waste time. We squander time. We ask by your spirit, the spirit in, who has implanted eternity in our spirits, Lord, let that spirit capture our own and get us refocused, <coughs> get us really clued in to what's really going on in reality. And lead us to the realization that you are reality, you are now, you are the fullness of time as you lead us into eternity. We thank you for your word today. Give us grace to walk in the light mm -hmm. through Christ our Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. You have been given a little card, I think, when you came into the service. The congregation still believes in.